Should I use this or that? Uh, my intellectual development uh, kind of finished on Leslie Nielsen movies, so I'm very worried about my, my microphone. I don't know if you watched that. Uh, and <clears throat> yes, I was listening to my pretty bizarre background and uh, being a final speaker today. It's going to feel like Stalin. And, <laughs> and uh, I have a pretty ba bizarre background. I was one of economic advisors to Gorbachev's government. I wasn't the advisor. I wouldn't take the blame for ruining 11 time zones. Uh, but <laughs> um, I was an advisor, which nobody listened to, and look what happened. And in, in Washington, D.C., economists, government economists, sounds like an oxymoron, but, but the government economists came up with the abbreviation TBTF. TBTF means too big to fail. Too big to fail, TBTF. And definitely the Soviet Union was TBTF because it was 11 time zones, was one-sixth of the world surface, was much bigger than the United States and Canada combined, completely destroyed by its own government. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so I never planned to defect, and I don't like the word to defect. Defect means you give up something you believed in, which was not the case with me. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but then I unexpectedly found myself in the in, um, United States. Uh, and it was at first, it was a candy store, but then I think that developments of the last 10 years uh, led for me to look for another uh, defection destination. <laughs> and and only, only last November kind of stopped me from actively pursuing this goal. Uh, because <laughs> uh, uh, this year, actually, it's the 100th anniversary, the centenary of of the Bolshevik Revolution, of the Socialist Revolution in, in Russia, on the, which happened in uh, November of uh, uh, 1917. Uh, and uh, uh, not many people celebrate it. In Russia, they have kind of national mourning of this event, but not in the United States. And definitely the flagship of celebration of, of Soviet socialism is the New York Times, which we call... <laughs> Kind of, we can call New York Pravda, and and uh, New York Pravda definitely is uh, now they it's it's really I was trying to prepare some kind of an academic presentation with graphs and charts about about um, healthcare around the world for this, and I still have some of that. But last uh, Saturday when I was doing that, I looked at the New York Times. And they had this fantastic article that Soviet Union actually uh, had the, the highest amount of communism orgasms in the world. <laughs> I'm not making it up. It's just uh, uh, that New York Times have this whole series of articles praising Soviet Union. That's, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is the orgasm article. And... and, um, <laughs> and Amazingly enough, yeah, that's the whole idea is that why women had better sex under socialism. <laughs> and, and the lady who wrote it, a certain Kristen Godsey, uh, and she's professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League School. Uh, what was her me me methods of kind of finding out why these orgasms were so prominent in the, in the Soviet bloc countries? She would, um, she would interview 70 years old people, uh, women, in, in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, uh, asking them whether they had more orgasms under socialism or capitalism, when, when they were 20 years old under socialism, or when they are 70 living under capitalism. <laughs> and and uh, sure enough, <laughs> and I was thinking, why in the world New York Times would publish such a stupid article? And then it occurred to me that the reason is very simple, because everything else points into opposite direction. Everything was, I mean, we, in Russia we have a good saying that Russia is a great place to be from. <laughs> and, and kind of like, the farther the better. And, uh, <laughs> and while, um, 
And it's impossible to prove it, to prove that, that, that there was any kind of successes under, under, under socialism. Uh, because life expectancy, for example, in uh, <clears throat> 1989, the, 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 the year of my, of my defection, um, was 57 for men and 65 for women. Uh, gross domestic product per person was $1,800. So it's not, not much to boast about. So then orgasm came pretty, pretty handy. And, <laughs> and, and so there is at least something that we should be proud of. <laughs> and, uh, and then <laughs> another interesting thing that, that the Professor Godsey uh, she, she uh, also credited Bolsheviks with the introduction of universal suffrage. That universal suffrage, that, that women got the suffrage. They became parts of this wonderful socialist democracy. And, uh, they, <clears throat> and uh, if you will look at this quote of Mr. Stalin, uh, he, <laughs> he kind of disclosed the, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that the suffrage was pretty funny. He used to... <laughs> He used to say that, uh, that uh, I don't care who votes how, what I care is who counts these votes. <laughs> and, and the people like Professor Godsey, uh, that, that she, she believed all this stuff, right? It's just, uh, just unbelievable. So we should keep in mind, I think, that, that what the Soviets, uh, the Soviets and, and other victims of, of socialism, uh, that they are teaching us a lesson. They're teaching us a lesson. Well, in Russia, we have also saying that the only lesson of history that it does not teach us anything. And to some extent, I think that it's true. But in the Soviet Union alone, anywhere from 43 to 61 million people were murdered by its own government. And, uh, and I think just to remember this, the memory of these innocent people, we should at least know that freedom is really uh, just uh, pretty easy to, to, um, to defeat. And American experiment, which began in 1776, now I think is, is under a very kind of heavy test, uh, durability test. And, and we're already uh, um, kind of revising our history. Uh, I remember Sir Winston Churchill, looks like Churchill, he was just only talking in, in quips. And, um, and he, um, he made a point that, he said, Russia is the only country in the world with unpredictable past. <laughs> so so it's, it's very difficult to predict the future because of that. And I would say that, that we became the same, that we are rewriting our past, that in the United States, history became just the politics in reverse, as Lenin used to say. And, uh, and I think I would agree with, with our president that, that if you would, um, and that's what's happening in Chicago, I live just maybe 50 miles from Chicago, that they already renamed the park or the Washington Park, or George Washington already is, uh, as well as Andrew Jackson. So these people already are kind of uh, out of history. <clears throat> and then will come Thomas Jefferson and everybody else, and uh, all of these uh, slave owners. Uh, but why would they do that? I think that because that these slave owners, they authored fantastic documents, uh, which provides us with the foundation of this country. And then, and then if uh, these people are bad, then the, the Constitution is bad, and, and Bill of Rights is bad, and Declaration of Independence is bad. And, <clears throat> and, and I am very much surprised and dismayed. Uh, my congressman is Paul Ryan. And, uh, and he spoke in my classes, I know him personally, and I, uh, but I don't want to know him anymore uh, or talk in my classes. <clears throat> so if we will go to medicine, and <clears throat> not exactly to medicine, but to property rights, what is ownership, what is... And <clears throat> John Locke, he used to say, who owns you? Who owns you? Do you own yourself? And if you own yourself, you're a free man. If you don't, you're a slave. And that was absolutely true. And it is absolutely true. And, <clears throat> and under socialism, what is socialism? It is nothing but public slavery. Most of my colleagues would disagree with me, um, especially in American academia, which is kind of became a, 
uh, kind of a preserve for, for Marxist thinking. And, um, and if you have this, if you don't belong to yourself, and people under socialism do not belong to themselves, they belong to government. The government is telling them what to do and when and how. And government is making choices, because what is freedom? Freedom is nothing but choice. So you have, a, <clears throat> you have freedom, you have choices. Slaves do not have choices. Um, because then the slave owners, uh, say private or government slave owners, they make decisions for them. And the people do not belong to themselves anymore. <laughs> and um, I'm using the word socialist and socialism instead of communism, because mo most of social science professors in the United States would say that, that um, communism was bad, communism was bad, fascism is bad. But socialism is good, socialism is good. That, that in the Soviet Union, they just didn't try socialism. They had a, a Congress, Marxist, World Marxist Congress in a very appropriate place, Amherst, Massachusetts. And um, that's where right now the center of Marxist thought is. And, uh, <clears throat> and when the Soviet Union collapsed, I mean, if you are a Marxist in the United States, you should probably kind of make a point. I mean, why did it do that? And so they adopted a resolution in this Congress that that what happened in the Soviet Union was not socialism, it was not communism, it was state capitalism. So capitalism failed again, and this time ruined the Soviet Union. Uh, so if you have this, this kind of ideas, then I think what Confucius was, used to say, then when words would lose their meaning, people would lose their liberty. So what's the difference between socialism and communism? <coughs> communism is just utopia, it never was practiced. It was never practiced, and <coughs> um, it was never practiced because Marx, when he was asked by Engels when communism would, would descend on us, communism means withering away of the state. There will be no state. We shouldn't have any government because we would be such angels that we would be self-governing ourselves. We don't need any government. Um, there will be no money. People would work as hard as they possibly can, and they will consume as little as they possibly can. So they will be real, real angels. And when he was asked, when would that occur? And he, Mark said, 500 years from now. 500. So we're still in the wait list for another 300 years. <laughs> and, but what happened was socialism, abolition of private property. And definitely, if you don't have private property on yourself, if you don't belong to yourself, then you are a slave. Uh, Marx, in, in, that's from Communist Manifesto, in communist society, nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. Uh, so that was the, the kind of the, the carrot before the masses that that they will at certain point reach this wonderful, wonderful uh, stage in human development. And then after work, they can go to some huge public warehouses, which will be like, I don't know, Costco or Sam's Club, and, but without cashiers. And they can collect whatever they like to, uh, and, but they will again, they will be such a wonderful people that they would not take, take an ounce more than they really badly need. So then <coughs> Marx, he realized that, that if you introduce socialism, you need to take private property from people and to enslave people, and people would probably uh, would, not, would not be very pleased with that. And so <coughs> his point is that uh, when in the process of building this wonderful society, you need to resort to mass murder, to mass murder. And mass murder, he was pretty explicit about that. Because again, many intellectuals in the United States, they believe that Lenin or Stalin, they kind of distorted Marxist vision. Marx was a great humanist, but uh, he, was, um, he was promising the terror, he was promising mass murder. And why, why killing is essential under socialism? Because socialism does not have any incentives to do anything. If all of you will be paid the same, no matter what you do or don't do, then very soon people would realize that the best thing is not to do anything. 
they had, a, they had a saying that they pretend they're paying us, we pretend we're working for them. So this kind of pretense, and it was over, over universal, universal idea, uh, and which was especially bad in healthcare system, uh, because that, uh, <clears throat> uh, that resulted in, a, in this, this awful vital statistics uh, with, um, Remember, I worked uh, <coughs> in my office in, in, um, in Moscow. We had this secret. They had interesting Linar. They had three different types of statistics. One was just propaganda for, for mass, uh, which they publish in, in newspapers. Uh, then another one was uh, classified, classified. So if it will leak out, then people would see that we actually live not as good, uh, not as, good as, as the propaganda is telling us, but still very good. And the third one was, uh, was the top secret statistics, which was telling that, that people are kind of in a deep uh, something. And, and, and so in the, in the deep statistics, uh, they had mortality rate 45, 45. In the, in the places like Yakutia, Saha, that's the Far Eastern country, uh, parts of Soviet Union, over 100. And I, I had a pretty dubious pleasure also of working with Mr. Yeltsin before he, uh, before he became president of Russia. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Yeltsin, he was, all the time, he was kind of governing under influence. And, um, and, <laughs> and, uh, he, and he, um, he once said in my presence, he said, Russia is, Russia is just white Africa. <laughs> and, um, and, it's just white Africa. And, and his top aide, he came to him and whispered something in his ear. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not white Africa, it's cold Africa. <laughs> and and uh, because statistics was, uh, vital statistics was very similar, was very similar in, in these in this cases. Then um, how many people they killed? Well, KGB admitted in Soviet Union that 43 million people were killed. And, uh, um, so Solzhenitsyn Foundation, a great American demographer, R Rudolf Rammel from University of Hawaii, he believes 60, 61 million. And between us, it doesn't matter for me much because both numbers are completely out of my understanding. And Stalin used to say himself that death of one is a tragedy, death of a million, just statistic, nothing else. So that was... <clears throat> Overall, that's Rudolf Rammel's numbers, about 200 million people were murdered by their own governments. Um, I know it's after, after this wonderful dinner, maybe we should move to another. Uh, so socialism, the great Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, uh, he believed that there are two different patterns of socialism, two different patterns of socialism. So especially, I think it's interesting uh, kind of to talk about that in the wake of Charlottesville disaster. And uh, what are these two patterns of socialism? One is Russian pattern. He wrote that in 1935. Uh, and the Russian pattern is purely bureaucratic. Everything is owned by the state. Everything is owned by the state. And sure enough, say, in, in Russia, uh, even shoeshine stand would be, uh, would be run by the government employee. So there's no private property whatsoever. Um, and the whole country was run as a kind of as a post office um, and the postmaster general, as one means. Well, in 1935, he probably didn't know that was the deadliest post office possible. And, <clears throat> and another one is, uh, is German, German pattern. The, the second is uh, preserves private ownership of markets, um, nominally, nominally, but it still has central plan, central plan. So, so Nazism, uh, the German National Socialism, was a, another type of socialism, um, national socialism, which was also based on central planning, on central planning. Uh, I'm sorry to kind of lecture you about planning, but I remember Mr. Gorbachev, that's the funniest thing I ever heard from him. Uh, at one of those meetings, he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, some economists believe that central planning does not work. This is not true. The problem, the real problem we have, that we never had a good plan. <laughs> that's the... <laughs> And, and, when, and when somebody's saying that, yeah, and I remember we're sitting next to 
to my immediate boss at that time, first deputy prime minister of the Soviet Union. And he said, Yuri, do you think there is something behind this birthmark? <laughs> and, and I said, I said, no, I think it's just shallow space. He said, he said exactly. <laughs> That's, uh, the, the other funny thing, before I forget, with, with Mr. Gorbachev I heard from, uh, we, had, um, we had another economist, minister of national economy, Abel Aganbegian. He was considered to be father of perestroika. He is, is the biggest, we called him biggest economist in the world. He was even bigger than me, maybe 400 pounds at least. And he, he used to say, yeah, we need to build Swedish model of socialism. He said. And Gorbachev was tired of this. He said, Abel, where you would get Swedes? Yeah, who would build it? Yeah, where you would get the Swedes to build Swedish model? And, and, and he was absolutely right. So in Soviet Union, definitely, they had these mass murderers all the time. And for the reason is, if you don't have incentives, but you want people to do something you want them to do, then the only way to do it is to point a gun at their head. It's something called negative incentives to threat people with, 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 with death or, or with, with Siberia or things like that. And, uh, and so that's why they were murdering. And the more they would murder people, the better economy would do. <laughs> I'm working at the Library of Congress in something called Volkogonov Archives. Dmitry Volkogonov was a Soviet general, propaganda person. Uh, he was such a liar, I would never, when I, he would see him on TV, I would switch it off right away. It was just much worse even than, I don't know, Rachel Meadow or whomever <laughs> else. And, and, and so, um, and I couldn't believe, well, probably Ms. Meadow is not like him, but I couldn't believe that this very person, um, in 1981, he was in Austria, and he bought a Xerox machine. And he was making highly legal copies of everything going through his desk. So he was, uh, yeah, so he was, uh, he was anti-communist in hiding, like many other people. And he, um, and he had, uh, he collected copies of 46, 46 boxes, big boxes of this handwritten memos of Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, um, Brezhnev, Gorbachev, of all these monsters. Um, uh, he, he, he had this collection. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, he became national, national security advisor to Mr. Yeltsin. And he approached the US ambassador in Moscow saying that he has this collection of super so secret documents and he wants to move them to the United States. And, um, and our ambassador, he, he said, um, okay, I will put you in contact with the agency, that means with the, with the CIA, with the agency. And Mr. Volkogonov, he said, no agency, please. Uh, uh, I want to put them in the Library of Congress. And if the agency would like to read them, they can get a reader's card and go and, and read. Yeah. Uh, well, he was probably right, because the agency would put it on the lead again. Uh, I don't think anyone from the agency got the reader's card, but I did. And I am working on this archives. It's just fantastic. It's, it's unbelievable what kind of evil um, the, the, some humans would, uh, would have. For, for example, Lenin uh, uh, is writing, uh, the commissar from South Russia, he's saying, dear comrade Lenin, you told us to fight religion, but you didn't explain how. Lenin is writing him back, dear comrade imbecile, <laughs> murder religious people, that's how, Lenin, postscript, and murder them the way that everybody will tremble with fear 150 miles around. And post postscriptum, administer them communion with lead. And so that was the, that's so-called lead poisoning was the, the, the leading cause of death in 1930s. In 1930s, they, uh, they were murdering people with a speed of 1,500 a day, 1,500 a day. Uh, so they, in one day, they would kill more people than Tsars in the whole 19th century. And they had a lot of other, this is the, uh, uh, the good thing about, they, they were kind of like, like spiders in a jar. So they, they, then Stalin killed them all as well. They killed millions of people, and that, that's all of these mass murderers. Uh, in between them, they killed uh, either 43 or 60, 43 million people was admitted even by 
by the boss of KGB, um, um, Mr. Krichkov, and he was put on, uh, we had this policy of glassness. Uh, you maybe remember that Soviet Union was the, uh, the engineer, this, the, the, the worst kind of medical disaster, uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl, last year I was speaking for doctors for, for disaster preparedness and about Chernobyl, and it's just amazing, I mean, uh, that back in Soviet Union, um, Mr. Gorbachev, he was so outraged. We, I remember some meetings with him. He was outraged that he was not informed about Chernobyl, about what really happened in Chernobyl. He was telling us that he actually heard about Chernobyl from Swedish radio or something like that. And because these this clouds from Chernobyl, they were blown into the direction of Northwest. And, uh, and so in Sweden, there they was rain, radioactive rain, and their own nuclear power station in Uppsala began to shut down automatically because they thought that this is their problem. Uh, and so Mr. Gorbachev was, was, was outraged. He declared this policy of glasnost, of something called openness, more transparency in government. And I didn't know, I found it only in these archives, that he knew about everything 10 minutes after it happened. And they had a secret meeting of Politburo in which he made some decisions which I think he shouldn't be proud of. For example, to send 700,000 troops to fight Chernobyl disaster. And this young 18, 19 years old kids with a brand new Kalashnikov um, uh, machine guns and in the brand new uniforms, but without brushes, without brooms, without anything else, without any protective gear, they were sent to fight radiation in Chernobyl. Uh, so that's how many people died, we don't know, because they, they I mean, it's kind of like the same as with orgasms that, not, that were not recorded properly. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, so there's uh, Grigory Zinoviev, yeah, he, for example, used to say that uh, we must carry along with us 90 million out of 100 million of Soviet Russia's population. As for the rest, we have nothing to say to them. They must be annihilated. Uh, that was, just could read that in every paper. Um, Stalin definitely, he was, uh, he was a champion of mass murder, at least in the Soviet Union. Mao Zedong killed even more people, but Stalin was, uh, and, uh, and amazing, <laughs> and, and uh, amazingly enough, that Stalin, that the first Soviet government were extremely bright people. Lenin could speak seven languages, play piano, whatever. Trotsky would write poetry in French. Um, Stalin looked like Borat. Uh, but it turned, uh, it turned them into mass murderers because they were enforcing something which was completely contrary to human nature. And then if you do that, then uh, that really is, 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 a, complete, is a complete disaster. Um, in my classes, I am showing sometimes this quote. And who said this? And, um, and most of my students would say, Bernie Sanders, of course. <laughs> but it was, uh, <laughs> it was way before him. It was this person, another hero of the socialized medicine. And uh, uh, amazingly enough that he was really into medical field. And uh, for example, the first law, Nazi law, passed almost immediately after he was sworn as a chancellor, was the law of the, for the prevention of progeny of hereditary disease. Because if you have slaves, then uh, it's kind of like a huge cattle herd, and you need to, you need to administer some veterinarian kind of services to them, and would not how to feed them, how to administer that. And that's why they were killing people, because, I mean, as bad as private slavery is, um, but in private slavery, it does make much sense to kill your slaves, because you will be destroying your own wealth. Uh, however, in public slavery, who cares? I mean, this is, a, if, you have the <clears throat> if you have a compassion of Department of Motor Vehicles, then you, you don't, I mean, it's a government, it's nobody's. So, um, so then the slaves, the public slaves, are not only an asset, but also a liability. 
And in the Soviet Union, I remember myself very well, because I was very interested in medicine. I was born in a medical family. Several generations of people were doctors and uh, or medical researchers. My, my parents, my sister, she is um, a professor of immunology in the University of Chicago. Uh, they, all, <laughs> they all kind of, uh, they were medical people, but they hated sick people. So they, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they all kind of defected into research. So she is working on databases, I mean, without seeing sick people or anything, yeah, just a computer screen. And, and so I'm the only black sheep in the family, and because of that, um, but I heard, I mean, was, was following what has been very interested in what, what was the medicine. And I had my own kind of pretty funny experience with Soviet medicine, because when I began to work for Gorbachev's government, uh, uh, in all socialized healthcare systems, you have usually two or three tier system. One is for gray masses, for the cattle. So you just, whatever, administer them something. Soviet medical budget was $37 per person per year. So that's the, the not, not much. Uh, it's kind of would be enough for, uh, I mean, dispensary of uh, aspirin or things like that. And, uh, uh, but when I began to work for the government, for the top echelons of the government, I was moved from that the system for the masses to, to the system for the really valuable people. And, um, and so they sent me to a hospital to, for inventory, what kind of new body the, the government got. And, and I'm a week already just doing tests and whatever. Uh, and I was thinking, why in the world? I mean, probably maybe something is growing in me or something, whatever. <laughs> was very concerned about my health because they wouldn't let me out. I would say, I want to, to, to go to work. And they would say, no, 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 you should be here. And I invited, and I had a, I had a doctor, uh, my doctor, she, she was as, um, she kind of looked very nice. Uh, well, I can say as American academic, uh, very nice. You know, it was optically, Advanced, uh, but op optically endowed or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, and so, um, and at that time I had, I didn't have this capitalist accumulations, and I was, uh, <laughs> was kind of twice younger and whatever. So I invited her for a dinner, and, um, and my, my only curiosity was what's going on with me. And um, she kind of misunderstood me. She thought I had something else in mind. And, <laughs> But we had a nice dinner, and I, at the end of the dinner, I said, so what's going on? I mean, why? Because they told me that I will be another week there. And she said, you should know better, you are economists. And uh, <clears throat> I said, what do you mean? Uh, she said, well, we have a, you know that, how hospitals are assessed. Uh, they have a system of assessment. If you don't have a market, you need to have bureaucratic assessment of everything. And, and so how do they assess? Uh, number one, indicator was mortality rate. It's bad if, if people are dying like flies in the hospital. And number two is occupancy, because, because then you would just get rid of everybody and nobody would die there, or be zero mortality rate. So you need to have, <laughs> occupancy should be very high as well. But then even the last dyslexic in that system, or medicrat, as this, uh, Ralph Weber wrote a wonderful book, I'm enjoying right now. Um, and um, uh, Soviet medicrats, uh, they, um, they realized that, that, that then you need to have a full hospital, but with what? With healthy people. <laughs> because sick people can die and <laughs> spoil your statistics. And that's what she told me. She said, if you would be really sick, you would be at home. That was her. <laughs> A point, yes. So it's, it just tells, then they would change it to something else, and then something else would be as funny or as, as, as tragic as, as it was. And I wrote quite a lot of articles, you can Google me, uh, about Soviet medical care with the self descriptive titles Socialized Healthcare Nightmare, or uh, um, I think in Journal of Physicians and Surgeons, I. I wrote a pretty big article about, the, about uh, compa comparing all types of medicine, uh, 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 disastrous medicines uh, in the world, not only in the Soviet Union. But in the Soviet Union, it was, uh, I mean, just anecdotal thing. 
uh, was just amazing. Uh, my, my father was um, a professor of, in medical college in Kazan, and I would sometimes would go and they would say, he's in the morgue in the anatomic theater. Would go there, he's sitting, uh, chewing sandwiches, the cats around, all these dead people, and it just was, uh, was amazing. And I said, well, how about cats? And he said, well, cats are even, you can find them in surgeries even. Um, then 60%, you wouldn't believe it, 60% of all, of all medical facilities in the Soviet Union in 1989 uh, didn't have either running water or sewer system. And that was a country which was superpower number two, sending people to space. You can again <laughs> Google this. Um, but then they, you go for a surgery to a hospital. It's mostly rural hospitals. I wouldn't kind of, uh, uh, but in rural hospitals, you, you have a surgery then. After that, a nurse will go and pick up some water from the well. They would usually boil it, uh, clean you up. Then you go to the outhouse. Uh, just uh, to, to do what you need to do. Or they maybe can serve you, but then you need to pay. That was the, the most corrupt system as well, the most corrupt system. Uh, so the National Socialists, that's returning back to, to um, Charlottesville or whatever, uh, or to, to 1930s, um, these are two coins of the same, uh, two, two sides of the same, of the same coin. Um, <clears throat> It was a great Russian writer whom nobody knows in the United States. He was, however, as great as Solzhenitsyn. Uh, I would even prefer him to Solzhenitsyn. I mean, both of them great. Uh, but he was also a gulag prisoner. And he, uh, and he wrote that, I used to think freedom was freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of consciousness. But freedom is the whole life of everyone. And his point is that your work is also part of your freedom part of your freedom. And, and unfortunately, I couldn't find, but I remember reading that in Russian a long time ago, uh, that he was talking about doctors who could not actually exercise their freedom in, in treating their patients, that the, between them and, and, and patients were this, this government. Uh, and sometimes they would remove, for example, life-supporting devices or whatnot just because a person already ran out of his or her quota of expenditures. So that's the, uh, they were, they had a particular kind of uh, orders that uh, say even hemodialysis would not be administered to people over 60. They would be considered already like social parasites because they did not produce, but they get government pension. And uh, so it was, it was pretty tough. I mean, again, you could buy into that. I mean, if you give bribes, if you, if you're, if you're a rich person, or whatever, I mean, rich, underground rich. So this, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, Marx was, amazingly now, speaking about national socialism and socialism, uh, that, that Goebbels, Josef Goebbels, who was a propaganda minister of Nazi Germany, he believed that even anti-Semitism, um, that, that Hitler, even borrowed anti-Semitism from Marx. And uh, um, as well as most of, of everything else. If you will read Mein Kampf, you would see his references to Marxism. Uh, and uh, um, I just don't want to, to talk much about it. But so then, um, really, uh, <laughs> that's the. the uh, this is a, the biggest propaganda person in the world, I think. He's also bigger than me, when, um, uh, Mr. Moore. To, to vaccinate my, my students against this virus of, of socialism, I, I was taking them to Cuba. Uh, to Cuba for maybe like almost 10 years. Uh, because it was, it was a phony embargo in the sense that it was so easy to get uh, something called license to bring students and, and whatnot. And so I would take them to Cuba, and uh, Cuba is really a disaster. I mean, just just disaster period. $9 per month average salary. $9 per month. It's such a sleazy place also. Uh, prostitutes, 
mothers are pimping their daughters and, and all these kind of awful things. Everybody's trying to sell you something. Um, however, people like, I mean, from, from my colleagues to Mr. Obama, they kind of, they praise their medical system for some reason. Uh, and medical system was, it's non-existent. Um, I have one student, she, she asked, uh, I have a friend in Cuba, a friend from my Moscow days. He was, he was a Cuban sent for brainwashing in Moscow. And uh, <laughs> he used to say that most of his colleagues who went to brain, the brains were washed with the water and, <laughs> and uh, were completely brainless, but he was not. And he would talk to my, he is up in the government. He, I promise never to disclose his name, but he, um, <clears throat> He would say that, uh, that yes, we have, uh, uh, we have everything is kind of in the making. And, and one young woman from my class, she said, everything is a disaster, but we heard you have the best healthcare system in the world. And he said, of course we do. Uh, however, as a true communist, he said, I see the room for improvement. If we would have doctors, medicines, clinics, hospitals, ambulances, it would be just perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, yeah, this is the ambulance <laughs> in Cuba. <laughs> if, you are, if you are interested in, in a lot of Cuban pictures of med medical field, it's called therealcuba.com, therealcuba.com. That's the, they have uh, the medical doctors, they, they put this, this a lot of, a lot of interesting, interesting pictures. And then, uh, and then we're walking out of auditorium and he was practicing his Russian on me, he said, Healthcare, healthcare, swim to Miami, that's the healthcare I know of. <laughs> and <laughs> so that's, uh, that's exactly, and uh, the, well, the cubits, I took these pictures and this is the store. Everything in the store, you need a coupon. Like we have this one free drink coupon and, <laughs> and here and, and there we would say one pound of beans or uh, one toothpaste or whatever else, everything. That's the only thing was this, this, this strange boxes that you could buy without coupons. And I asked, uh, what is there in the box? And they said, this is a baking soda. Baking soda, for some reason, baking soda is just free for the taking. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I, I made a mistake. I said, uh, I told them that they should put people who are in charge of baking soda in charge of everything. <laughs> and... <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And then when I was exiting Cuba, yeah, I was arrested. And so since then, I'm avoiding this island of, of freedom. <laughs> and, uh, as well as I'm avoiding um, Russia, to tell the truth. Because when Mr. Putin was elected on relatively free elections in 2000, in March of 2000, uh, as, a, as, a, as a president of Russia, uh, I wrote an article in Russian and was published in Russia with self-descriptive title, Meat voted for a meat grinder. And uh, it's, maybe it doesn't sound appetizing after, after <laughs> this wonderful dinner. Uh, but can you imagine that people who, 43 to 60 million of them were murdered, and they elect proud KGB person as, a, as their president. Can you imagine if in Germany, um, a, a former SS officer or a Gestapo officer would be elected even, um, even a dog catcher in a remote village. That would be a national uh, soul searching. It would be just a tragedy. And, and, so, and, he's, and he's a proud KGB person, proud KGB. So in my travels, uh, I, I mentioned that Russia is one sixth of the world's surface. So I'm exploring five sixths other than that. Because Mr. Putin is known that if you don't like him, uh, then your life expectancy just drops like a rock. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but I, having said that, I would say that, uh, that life in Russia is, is much better than it was under the Soviet Union. Last year alone, 12 million Russians, for example, went uh, for vacations in, into other countries, uh, the foreign tourism and everything. When I defected, it was 30,000 people would travel from this 300 million people country to other countries a year, and now it's 12 million. So, so I would say that Mr. Putin, he was successfully built fascist economy. And so that means that fascism is actually more, 
more efficient economically than, than socialism. Uh, this is all fixer-uppers in Cuba. Uh, so they, didn't, they didn't repair anything since 1959. However, they send a lot of doctors all over the world. They have 70,000 doctors they send. Uh, it's kind of like indentured slaves. So, for example, I met some of them in South Africa. I just was, uh, what, last Monday I was in South Africa. And uh, uh, I go there for very, very often. I kind of, uh, um, as I have a good friend. He, is, he was just was elected as a mayor of Johannesburg. Uh, a great guy. He, he's kind of like a South African Trump. He is a billionaire, billionaire. And he, uh, um, he's black. He made his money in... in under apartheid, yeah. he's uh, making this TV, TV interview saying that, that, um, that he would not be a successful entrepreneur um, under this free South Africa. So that's, that's very sad, but that's true. So he will run in 2019 for the presidency of South Africa. He's from opposition party, Democratic Alliance. And I just, we just made a, a movie called Tainted Heroes. Tainted Heroes about South Africa, about Nelson Mandela and the likes. And, and if you are interested, it's on YouTube for free. You can watch it. Uh, uh, and that's the, he calls me that I am an honorary black. <laughs> <laughs> he was introducing me to the, to the audience. And, uh, and the people were sitting there. He said, guys, you're just so upset by something. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a crime to be white. And he's black himself. And there was a person on the first row, he said, not yet. And uh, because they are going through a lot of this, the same kind of, when the government is pitching, pitting people against each other on the grounds of skin pigmentation and, and whatever they can find to pit people against each other. This is just, yes, it's just awful. But, but what the South African, South African government is paying Cuban government $1,000 per month per, per doctor, per doctor. And uh, the doctor is saving $200 a month from South African government, which is very tough call. I mean, you can, it's very difficult to live in South Africa for 200, they just really sad. And then, uh, then they began to defect and that's, so you can see how many of them are. Then, um, uh, speaking about kind of, I'm, I'm trying to prepare you for maybe for discussion and, lack, and, and questions uh, that uh, in the United States we have the major problem is that, that people are under impression that, that we have um, uh, problems with healthcare because free markets screwed up our healthcare. The same thing as propaganda and especially economic propaganda would tell us that that the Great Depression was a kind of something wrong with the, with the free market and it created Great Depression. Great Depression was, was engineered by the, by, the, by the Federal Reserve System. The same with, uh, with our healthcare. It's a problem not of free markets, but the absence of any markets because it's, it's ridiculous, absolutely. Well, high cost of healthcare. If today I enjoyed very uh, many presentations telling us how cheaper it would be if we wouldn't have middlemen, if we wouldn't have federal government, and, and, and things like, like uh, uh, certificate of need and, and, and other uh, insane, insane kind of things. But why the, the high cost of healthcare is also, uh, the part of it is innovation definitely, innovation. I mean, how much will you pay for the hip replacement, say, 20 years ago, or bypass surgery 20 years ago, um, uh, nothing, zilch, zero. You could save a lot. No, no such thing, right? There was no such thing. So a lot of things that today we're paying a lot is, is a product of, of, of innovation. So solutions which, are, which I mean, the, the, the only solutions, if you can look from point of view of economics, would be to either on supply side to squeeze providers, because our medical personnel in the United States is the highest paid professionals in the world. And, um, and even the neurosurgeons is the highest paid profession in the United States, now labor market. So we can either squeeze them and turn them into, 
into kind of socialist slaves in Soviet Union. Uh, in Soviet Union, uh, a friend of, of our family was a neurosurgeon, very successful over there. But he received his salary was one third of the salary of a bus driver, so that was the kind of the the, uh, the cost of this, uh, and that's why healthcare was so cheap. Or you can deny care, deny care. Uh, that's the the uh, was speaking in. Uh, Sherman, Texas, I was, I was teaching quite close from here at the University of Dallas uh, on the leave of absence from my college. And, uh, <clears throat> and Sherman, Texas is just on the state line with Oklahoma. And, uh, and one lady, it was a Tea Party gathering, and because I was writing a book on Tea Party, then I realized that, my, that I can speak in all Tea Parties tax, tax deductible. And, uh, <laughs> And so I really exploited this opportunity and, uh, and was driving all around, uh, all around uh, uh, the state, the state of Texas. And one lady, she said, you are like, you are like Sarah Palin. Uh, you came here to scare us. And I said, exactly. I mean, I wish somebody would come to, to Russia in 1917 and scare that people, or to Cuba in 1959. Uh, uh, or to China in 1947 and scare that people. Uh, but then I was surprised that in Tea Party, there's, it's, it's, in, and I asked the organizer, I said, uh, <clears throat> why in the world uh, uh, um, you have these people who looks like very really left-wing person? She said, in Sherman, we don't have anything going on. So it <laughs> doesn't matter who comes, everybody would show up. So, <laughs> so, so if I would be a... a kind of a communist missionary, then the same people would show up, and, and <laughs> but not with the Tea Party slogans, but with something else. So what is the, <clears throat> what kind of, uh, um, what kind of uh, hopes we have? Uh, uh, one is, is that right now we're going through a very vulnerable time in the United States. I think what I see is, looks like a slow motion socialist revolution uh, kind of in the making, uh, very difficult to, uh, to, to see where it's going to because, because I, I'm, I'm, I hate to say that, but I think that we kind of lost cultural wars because in, 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 in academia, I mean, there are very few people like myself and I was hired only because I'm from Moscow. So that's the... <laughs> so the <laughs> And when they, when they understood that they got a lemon, it was too, 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 too late already. Yeah. And uh, so that's the, well, look at Hollywood, or look at everything, or, or fake news. I mean, this is, this is just ridiculous. I was, just before coming here, was listening to fake news. Maxine Waters, the congresswoman from uh, Bay Area in, in California, yeah, she was accusing Ben Carson that he is white supremacist. Can you imagine? And, <laughs> and <laughs> speaking about her, um, my occupational hazard is to watch Russian television. So I'm watching Russian television all the time. <laughs> and they had a funny program about Maxim Waters. They have two hackers, very famous, Vavun and Lexus. And, um, and they have their own radio program once a week. And Vavun called Maxim Waters and introduced himself as Leonid Groisman, who is the Prime Minister of Ukraine. And he said, I'm this Leonid Groisman calling from Kyiv, and uh, our in Ukrainian intelligence found out that, that Russians logged into the electoral system of Limpopo and, uh, and um, imposed uh, eyebolid, uh, which in Russian means ouch, uh, imposed uh, eyebolid as the president of Limpopo. And Maxine Waters, it's just, it is real recording. And she said, that's exactly what happened here in the in, in United States. And, uh, and she said, I'm very much surprised that I didn't get any kind of briefing about Limpopo about this. Uh, but Limpopo is not a country, it's just a river. And, <laughs> and, and then, and, um, uh, and then, presumed Mr. Grossman, he said, we are also working, we'd like to have your advice. We are working on upgrading our telephone system because Russians logged in our telephone system and can hear whatever we're talking about. 
and we want, but we don't want American telephone company because, because then CIA would listen to whatever we say. Um, and I was kind of looking into a Mexican telephone company, Taco Bell. What, <laughs> what, what, what do you think about it? <laughs> and she said, I'm not making it up. And she said, um, she said you know what? Uh, um, as a member of Congress, I cannot give you any advice on what kind of carrier you should choose. Uh, so that was very prudent, nice. Uh, I think it, they put it on YouTube as well, so if you can. We'll put Max in Waters and Ra Russian hackers. So if it would be <clears throat> the, uh, again, because I'm getting too old, it's, it's too, too, too old for me to defect again. So I think that we don't have the, Ludwig von Mises, great Austrian economist, he would say that, are we historians of decline? Are we historians of decline? And he would say, no matter what, decline or not, the only way to survive is to fight, to fight. And I think this is the most important. I am kind of, my true title is a overtaxed Wisconsin taxpayer, and, my, and I, have a, I never had a, even an idea of having children back in the Soviet Union. Came to the United States, exploded with kids, have uh, four kids. And so this is, uh, and, and just for them, I think, I'm very, very, uh, my son is the only person on this planet who is to the right of me. That's, and he's 14, 14 years old, yeah, 40. and uh, uh, that's the, uh, so on this note, I would be happy to maybe throw some of these boxes uh, at you, if you have any questions or comments. What does the third point mean, restore markets? Oh, restore markets, that's what you are doing here today. How to make, because market, I mean, if you will look what market is, the, the nervous system of the market would be prices. Prices is telling us what, what people want, how much they want it. And, uh, and, and without prices, it's like a paralysis. It's like AIDS of the economic system when everything is in place but nothing works. And so this is the, this is the, the I mean, without prices, I mean, and I remember when I came to, to the US, I, was, I went to, to a doctor, and I asked, how much is it? And he said, how would I know? And <laughs> how would I know how much it is? And he said, you will receive a, a copy of the bill. But, uh, but then without price, price signals, people usually don't behave well. Uh, Inflation, for example, distorts people's ability to choose. Um, or our healthcare system without prices. Third party PE uh, is absurd, is absurd. So, so I think that you are doing a great job here in, in trying to, to return, return our healthcare system to normalcy. That's the Maybe I depressed you enough already. Most healthy market doctors are Christian, but Balmisa says his system is incompatible with Christian thought. So how do you put that together? His system is incompatible with Christian thought. That, that's what Balmisa himself said. Well, it's, it's not incompatible. It's not a religious system. That's what he meant. No, he, didn't, no, he said it was contrary. Uh, where did he say that? A number of places. I can find it for you. Well, please find. It sounds like fake yeah. news to me. Yeah, he said, <laughs> he said, he said that charity. He said that, what are we, he said that charity, charity in, undermines the market. Yes, charity does definitely. So that because what charity is more important, the market or charity? Market. market definitely. Well, charity is also part of the market in the sense that that if I'm giving then that means I have utility from giving, right? I'm, I'm enjoying myself in the process of giving. Some people are enjoying themselves in the process of taking, but some in giving. So it is, it is utility maximizing activity as well. Um, but charity and markets, what he meant also, I think, especially Murray Rothbard, his, his, great, um, his great student, and I had a... I uh, had a kind of, um, uh, was lucky enough to, to work with him for, for five years. He was the first great economist I've met in the United States. And, 
that charity is, in, is an imposition of one person's preferences on others. So that's how they would think about that. But it's kind of, I would say, pretty far-fetched. Better give to, uh, the, to a free market medical association. <laughs> that's the... I have a Any question other? here. Yes, <clears throat> I was wondering um, your thoughts on, on two things. Uh, first of which is our cost curve in medicine and the percent of GDP that we are consuming is just really not sustainable. I think we're the highest in the world. And I wondered what your thoughts were on what point it's sort of, you know, do or die. What, when, do, when is it going to turn? And the second, the follow-up question on that is, what do you think is the most powerful force that can actually start turning that curve? Yeah, so there's two questions, and uh, the first question when we were spending so much. Well, yes, I agree that, for example, um, Russians, they spend about 18% of their income on booze. <laughs> so maybe we should switch and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and cut this, this first curve kind of down. But, but from another hand, I think it's the richest country in the world with, uh, with the aging population uh, that, that I think that's maybe too much, but it's very difficult to say. I mean, who am I to tell, to tell the, the people how much they should spend? Um, besides that, we have this, this uh, cost, inefficient, uh, cost inefficient system with a third party pay. That's a ridiculous system. I mean, if I would take your, your credit card and go on shopping, then, then um, I wouldn't be probably as frugal as if I would use my own. Uh, uh, so this, this, these are kind of issues. We spend quite a lot because if you will look, it's 18.7% GDP for, for, for just healthcare provision plus the industry of, of medical devices. Uh, so then uh, a lot of other things which are not being counted. So it's, it's at least one-fifth, if not one-fourth of our economy. And that's why I would say that the Obamacare is such a disaster because it's a transitional thing. I mean, they it's very deviously devised. Uh, that means that it's unsustainable right now, so you need to go further. And, and, and further towards socialism, because you, you, if, you, if you go this way, and if they couldn't arrest this movement, then, then it would be um, definitely uh, um, the single pay system at best, or at worst, it will be a nationalized healthcare system in general. So that's the, the uh, so I don't know whether we should have a kind of this, I think that, that uh, probably, you have, in our system, I am, for example, I'm paying, I think, like about $18,000 for my family in, in healthcare um, premiums. So definitely I'm, I'm trying, or at least my wife is trying to get as much possible as whatever. So this, this system is inviting people for waste, inviting people to get more than, than maybe they need or whatnot. But this is very, because, because healthcare, Healthcare market is a market of something called asymmetric information. So we don't, for example, in the Soviet Union, many people were happy about their healthcare system. For what reason? Because they didn't know anything else. That's one thing. The propaganda would say that people in the West are dying in the streets all the time unattended, and, and they would be attended and they would get their free aspirin and, and kind of be happy. Um, but but uh, because, because, again, asymmetry of information, in, in defi definition is that you as medical professionals know more about myself than, than myself. Yeah. So is it should be based on utility or, or what kind of innovation we would face? Um, so it's, it's uh, uh, I don't see necessity to tell the truth to, to cut these expenditures. That's the... So, sir, I have a question. So, Assuming in a economically perfect world, we could roll back all the regulations. Let's, sorry. Let's assume in a perfect world, we could roll back all the regulations, remove all the government interference from healthcare. 
what regulations would we want to put in if we were to build a f free market? What regulations? Um, well, there's a different schools of thought. I mean, because it's different schools of thought, like Ronald Coase, the Nobel laureate, great economist. He would think that some regulations are needed, and he uses the, the example, say, of neurosurgeon, that he would prefer to have a neurosurgeon who would have some paper that he or she graduated from somewhere and got some degrees, uh, rather than, rather than uh, say, a plumber who imagined that he is a neurosurgeon. And, uh, and the only reason for that would be that, that transaction costs are very high. If I like, have six, six heads, I could risk one. But if I have only one, so for me, transaction costs can be overwhelming, right? If my head would be, I mean, probably be, be, beheaded or whatever. Uh, so, so because of that, uh, some economists, and he was pretty free market economist, would believe that is needed. Uh, other economists like Hans Hoppe, for example, the, the most, um, the most um, interesting Austrian economist living, um, he would think no, because if, if, um, if um, uh, the plumber would chop your head off, then uh, uh, your relatives can sue him and tort law and whatever, and then other people would not go to this, um, to this, to this plumber. So, so whether we need these regulations or not, uh, it's, it's, it's the matter of your consumer choice. What I was looking at, or what I was thinking about was at what point the government provides a service to the consumer in terms of antitrust or market control and things of that nature. Where does it cross the line when it becomes more than just control of a market, but like CON? Or does it become an anti-monopolist for that type of? Yes, I mean that's this anti-monopolist. The antitrust laws is the best example of that government destroying economy, that's right. because this is a, this is completely I mean idiotic thing, the antitrust, because there's something called economy of scale, so we we would never have a kind of a super monopoly, just because economy because. I don't want to be too technical, but because cost curves are U-shaped, U-shaped. So first you produce more and more and more, your costs per unit are going down, then they reach something called economy of scale where you should be producing. But then if you, are, if you cannot stop there, then it will be going up and up and up and up and you will go out of business because your costs would be too high. And in most, I mean, there's some, something called the, the fixed, fixed cost industries where where it would be better maybe, and no, not better, but where the cost would go down consistently, like Microsoft, for example. Microsoft was sued by federal government in 1999 um, for being a monopoly, but, but this is, this, this, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing because, because markets, you should define what the market is. I mean, the market for software, there are hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of providers, not millions. Or it's the market for browsers. So it's the market for operating system. And even if you will look at, at the market for operating system, then, uh, then is it a monopoly? Um, and if it is, then maybe because of the fixed cost. What does this mean, fixed cost? means that if you produce, if, um, if you have fixed costs only, then the more you produce, the cheaper it is. Because to add additional customers, for example, to, for Microsoft products is costless, right? Costless, because you create, for example, they spent $8 billion on Windows 10 to reduce, uh, to reduce at least my life expectancy. And, uh, and, <laughs> And then, uh, so they spend this much, but then adding additional person who will download the system uh, is, is costless. So, so that's the, uh, so I would say it's, it's the, most, the, most, the most insane, the, this, this antitrust thing. Then with, with, with other regulations, <laughs> regulations usually would be, uh, would be initiated by a regulated. By, by the people who regulate it. Yeah, I, I worked for, for George, uh, 
for George the First, not 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 the King George the First, George Bush, the first. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not not so old. Yeah, and uh, and his last, the last bill he signed into law, was about food labeling. You remember, you know that if you even get a bottle of water, it would say how much cholesterol it has and everything. And <laughs> and um, and who was lobbying for that? The food processing industry. Because if you are, say, Kraft or Oscar Mayer or whatever, it's easy for you to comply because you have high level of, say, industrial discipline. That means that, that this Bologna or that Bologna are exactly the same, the, the batches they produce of the, the deadly products. And, um, but if you are a kind of a smoke, smoke house uh, somewhere in the boondocks making your own bratwurst or, 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 or a sausage or whatever, it's very difficult for you to, to comply because you need, to, you need to, to then to do tests and change the labels and whatnot. So all regulations, I would say, all regulations are against the poor. All regulations are against, against small business, small business uh, to protect big business. So that's how they... Uh, the same as licensing, the same as everything else. Sometimes, I would say, licensing is maybe, some people would say, like Ronald Coase, that it's better to have a, to have a neurosurgeon with some paperwork done. Um, from one hand, but from another hand, definitely, if we would have, if, we would have, uh, if anyone could practice it, it would be much cheaper. Right? Much cheaper. Okay, we've got time for two more yeah. questions. If the good speaker will allow me, since you asked for a quote, uh, Mises is quoted as saying, a living Christianity cannot exist side by side with and within capitalism. Later in his career, Mises would allow that Christianity could exist within capitalism, but only if the Christians kept their opinions to themselves, only if they were marginalized and kept apart from the political and economic orders. There's much more, but it's clear there's an antipathy. So what? <laughs> So what? It's a Christian country. Well, that's the, well, that's, uh, I, well, he was not, I mean, unlike Stalin, he was not murdering Christians. Yeah, that was, uh, um, usually socialism and religion are incompatible. And, and that's what socialist leaders, they do understand that. Yeah, but capitalism and, and Christianity are not incompatible. And they usually would, uh, would kill religious people first. Because if you are religious, if you are Christian, or you are Jew, or you are Muslim, you cannot believe that Stalin is the greatest creature ever made. And so and Stalin realized that very well. And so that was the... the yeah, I mean, I, I, to tell the truth, I, I consider Mises as a great economist, not as a great, I don't know, cultural figure or whatnot. And what he thought about Christianity just doesn't... I'm not, I mean, it doesn't bother me. Really? Because he definitely was not a militant atheist. Uh, right? Any other? Really question? sounds like he was. <laughs> well, I am using my First Amendment rights. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? Any other questions? Yes. I, I depress you. You're, you're in. Right here. No, no. Over, no. over here. The opposite. Here. Uh -huh. Right here. Yeah. Right here. Because I have this. Never liked the system. Right here. I'm like on the KGB. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you talked about signals. Signals. Fio um, Panyata. You talked about signals of, of healthcare. And if you go to Keith Smith's site, you know that it's $5,865 for a chylocystectomy. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bill Grant, Sean Kelly, they'll, they'll put them out. We put it on on Twitter every time a doctor bids on any kind of procedure, it goes right on on our Twitter feed, mm -hmm. thousands a month. How can everybody help in terms of putting out signals of cash prices for medical care? Well, how, I mean, you wrote a fantastic book about the, the, how to eliminate insurance. And I think that this is, if everybody would do that, um, um, Dr. Jorgensen, he sent me a wonderful book, uh, um, um, PDF by email, uh, about healthcare system in Singapore. In Singapore, they have, uh, everything is, is, is priced. And at first, they, the government was forcing 
medical professionals to put prices. Uh, now they don't even need to do that because, because if you have competition in healthcare, that's a price competition. Price competition. So everybody would post their prices, definitely. Uh, so, so that's a good, and, and by the way, Singapore is spending 4.7% of their GDP on, on healthcare, and the vital statistics is as good as ours, if not better. Yeah, better even. Life expectancy higher and, and infant mortality rate lower. But we are a different kind of society. We're very, very diverse and whatnot. And, uh, so there are some, some, some good solutions, definitely. But what I'm, what I'm as just as, a, as an economist, I can say that without prices, there is no market. Uh, that just, uh, it's, it's, some people believe there is. Um, my first job interview was at Smith College in Massachusetts. And, 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 the, and the professor, a certain Andrew Zimbalist, uh, he said, uh, I read your articles, and I think that, that you're right, that, um, that we should move to market economy. But why should you privatize everything? <laughs> and I, I was uh, su surprised. I said, uh, what, what kind of exchanges we will have with stolen goods if that's not yours? <laughs> and, and he said, there is a... There is a country in this hemisphere which is the most successful economy. And I already had a kind of a dark suspicion. And I said, what do you mean Cuba? And he said, of course. You know, of course. I uh, can you imagine this. Uh, and we have people like that. And it's so many in the academy. It's depressing. I was in Montclair State University lately and debating a person. Uh, his, his name is George Farr. He is destroying young minds since 1970. <laughs> and he, for example, he pointed at me. He said, he's a CIA agent. I am a CIA agent. And, <laughs> and he said, uh, he's a CIA agent because, um, uh, because Stalin never killed anybody. And, uh, and that was a mistake, he said, because he didn't kill these people, and they bad-mouthed him after. And, and, and again, this person is just telling this kind of things and whatever, and we have 1,000 people in the audience, and, and uh, yes, and he, he was just going on and on and on. That CIA, he said, I'm from CIA. CIA declared the war on Iraq because we need some oil. And then we got oil, and then we declared the war on Afghanistan to get some pot and, and opium uh, to destroy, he said, to destroy progressives and minorities. And I could believe that, that the people would say something like that. Yes, that's all. Uh, uh, well, I think on this cheerful note, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can. Uh,